On behalf of Children and Family Futures and the Family Drug Court Learning Academy, welcome to our webinar presentation. Special thanks to the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, who supports the National Family Drug Court Training and Technical Assistance Program. For more information about Children and Family Futures, the Learning Academy, and the Family Drug Court TTA Program, please visit our website at cffutures.org. We hope you find this presentation helpful as you strengthen your partnerships and improve outcomes for families in your family drug court. Hello, today we're going to talk about governance structure and leadership in family drug courts. The question is whether your family drug court is built to last or left to fade. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Jane Pfeiffer, and I'm a senior program associate with Children and Family Futures. I've been providing training and technical assistance and working with family drug courts for more than 10 years across the country and helping many drug courts to identify their governance structure and identify ways to strengthen it. We'll also be talking about leadership and how leadership is crucial to the success of your drug court. The learning objectives for our presentation today is to understand the importance of cross-system and multi-level representation in governance, to understand the key tasks and responsibilities of family drug court team, steering committee, and oversight committee, and to understand the essential attributes of effective leadership and cross-collaborative programs. We hope that at the end of this presentation that you will have a better understanding of what governance and leadership is and how you can apply concrete and specific strategies to strengthen the work in your own drug court. So let's start with the term governance. What is governance exactly? Well, the definition that we have here is that it's the structure of a leadership body that can make policy decisions about an initiative or a collaborative. In family drug courts, this is often a challenge because we are a multidisciplinary team and we have to make policy and practice decisions for the entire team. And that really requires that we have all the team members participating in that policy and procedure making process. This can be challenging. Many of you who work in family drug courts right now know exactly the kind of challenges it presents. We're going to talk about some strategies after we define each of the levels of governance that we recommend for your family drug court. So why is governance structure essential? Well, we know that an effective family drug court starts with mission and vision. And a governance structure turns that mission and vision into the active work that's being done to help families achieve success. So we also know that governance structure can help each of the partners commit to and invest in the family drug court's mission and vision. It allows the family drug court, as, as you see here on the slide, it allows family drug courts to move from let's collaborate to this must be a priority by top officials. We know that the work of family drug courts is done in the operational team, those that are working day to day with the families in family drug court, but there are other levels of leadership that are critical to decision making and to helping the family drug court be successful. If key leaders in each partnership agency aren't committed to the shared mission and vision as well as the outcomes, we really have a family drug court that struggles to survive. And we know that those family drug courts that don't have this type of commitment really have trouble sustaining their efforts. We also know that to achieve lasting change, we really need to make systems level change and our governance structure can really assist in that process. One framework to use when we're talking about governance in family drug courts is what we call the three R's for systems change. Those three R's stand for relationships, resources, and results. So governance structure really is part of this process and really assists in making that permanent shift in doing business that relies on relationships. And anybody who works in a family drug court knows that family drug courts and certainly the team effort in family drug courts is all about relationships. Unless we have developed trust and we can work together effectively, family drug courts suffer. So those relationships really across systems and within the community are, who, are, are the entities that come together to make sure that family, children and families have uh, the, the resources that they need. So resources, that is the supports and services that, family need, that families need to achieve uh, the kinds of success they need is, is really part of what produces the, the results. And so in order, another way to put this is, in order to achieve the best results and outcomes for families and children, we need to make sure that we have the appropriate 
resources in place. To have those resources in place, it requires relationships. And we should think broadly about this. Those relationships are certainly at the operational team level, but they're also at varying levels of leadership within each partnering agency. Additionally, we all know that an effective drug court accesses the support and services and other resources needed for families when we partner and we develop relationships with the community and our community leaders. So let's take a look at the governance structure in family drug courts and talk about exactly what we, what we mean when we say governance structure. We're talking about a three-tiered, if you will, a three-tiered governance structure. The family drug court team, the steering committee, and the oversight or executive committee. Before we end today, we'll also talk about advisory committees, but at this point, we want to talk about who's really part of the policymaking recommendation and policymaking decision process. So these are the three, these are the three committees, uh, the three teams, if you will, that work together to govern a drug court, to set policy for, for the family drug court. We're going to talk about membership, how frequently the committees should meet, and what their primary functions are to help you understand better what your governance structure should look like. One of the things that I have noticed as I've worked with family drug courts across the country is that during the planning process before the drug court becomes operational, there's typically a planning team, and they maybe call it an executive committee or a steering committee or an oversight committee. The terms may be used interchangeably at first, and really this is the effort that the family drug court uses to, to develop policy and set policy before they begin operations. But then once the operation uh, then once the team rather becomes operational, sometimes that that uh, body uh, stops its uh, meeting or doesn't meet as frequently uh, because the team is so focused on operations. And of course, this is understandable, but we know that this is a challenge for many drug courts to get back in the practice of having having scheduled meetings to set policy. So let's talk more specifically about this. The first level is the family drug court team. Now, this could also be called the operational team or the core team. This is the team that works directly with families in family drug court. This is the team that uh, that holds their primary function is to staff cases. So uh, these team members attend staffing um, as well as court, and their their primary goal is to ensure client success. These Team members meet weekly or biweekly, discuss cases that are on, uh, on the court hearing for progress uh, reviews, and the membership typically is frontline staff from the partnering agencies. This is what we call the family drug court team, and they are uh, most certainly uh, the frontline, and they also provide uh, the, most, uh, the most helpful information for the rest of the levels of the governance structure to understand exactly what the strengths and needs of families are in the family drug court. The common barriers that we hear from many family drug court teams across the country <clears throat> are many. As you look at this list, you may be familiar with some of these, you may be experiencing some of these, and I know many of you have overcome these barriers. We know that frontline staff should really be encouraged to identify those common barriers because what it is that families are struggling with, what it is that the team is struggling with, this is what the other levels of the governance structure can help to address and to resolve. So by bringing those barriers to the policy making level of the governance structure or the governance body, this is, what, this is what helps make changes so that the family drug court itself can run more effectively. So whether it's not having enough referrals, whether it's missing key partners um, to attend staffing and contribute as, as a, an operational team member, uh, whether it's value differences or other client barriers that may exist, it's critical that the family drug court team be well aware that they are part of the governance structure and their primary role is to make sure to identify common barriers and to communicate that information to the next level of governance structure. That next level is called the steering committee. Again, many drug courts across the country have different names for this level um, within their governance structure. Um, however, every family drug court needs to have a steering committee. The primary function of the steering committee is to remove barriers to ensure program success and achieve the project's goal. Um, these goals, these project goals are 
typically identified when a program begins operation and they change over time and these the change of the goals or the the refinement and enhancement of the goals uh, can happen over time based on the changing needs of families or the community so the steering committee will be identifying these barriers based on information coming from the operational team and it's their job to help to remove those barriers the membership, the folks that are on this steering committee, are typically management or mid-management level from each of the partnering agencies. What's critical particularly about this, uh, about the, the membership and the, the committee members themselves, is that you have the right people at the table in order to make decisions uh, and, and to be able to speak for their agency. The steering committee is going to meet bi-monthly or monthly. Uh, sometimes you see steering committees meeting most frequently during the first couple of years of operation, um, but it's, it's critical that the steering committee meet regularly and that folks commit to a time to attend so that they can have an ongoing understanding of what's working and what isn't in the drug court. So to be an effective steering committee, there really is a couple of tips that can be helpful and uh, exist, existing steering committees uh, really should have set agendas. They should come with, as you see here on the, on the slide, they really should come to these committee meetings with a barrier busting mentality. And, and what we mean by that is that we really want this particular committee to understand that whatever challenges, whatever obstacles are in the way of families being successful, this steering committee's job, in fact, their primary function is to be able to resolve those issues. Sometimes they're able to resolve it at their level, other times they need other resources and other support, and they can, they can get that kind of support uh, from the executive committee and also from the community. So in order for a steering committee to be effective, uh, a, they need to designate a key staff person who is coordinating the efforts of the steering committee. This may seem like a minor point, but it's a critical one. Making sure that agenda items are set, that, ag that an agenda is prepared and shared with all the team members prior to the meeting, um, gathering the necessary information, again, gathering information particularly from the operational team, uh, helping to facilitate the discussion, or if there is a lead person, there if there is a different lead person who is facilitating, making sure that that, that person uh, who is facilitating has the necessary information they need. And then also, this key staff person should follow up on any action items that comes out of each uh, steering committee meeting. Now, in some cases, the key staff person we're talking about might be the coordinator, the family drug court coordinator, but other times it's a support person for the judge or the court or even one of the other partnering agencies. There's not a right or wrong key staff person to, to support and to carry out these actions, but it is critical that that person is identified. Typically, the steering committee members are busy with their with their full-time jobs and there needs to be a separate person who is responsible for coordinating and and uh, and making sure that the steering committee is supported. The third level is the oversight or executive committee. And again, many family drug courts out there have different terms for this committee, but this is the this is the committee, this is the governance structure level that's going to meet the least frequency. Uh, we sorry, least, least frequently, um, we see this committee meeting quarterly or in some cases semi-annually. There are lots of family drug courts out there where the executive committee meets only annually. And while we know that lots of good work can happen on an annual basis, we really recommend that this executive committee is meeting more frequently than that in order to help ensure long-term long sustainability and have more of an ongoing and up-to-date understanding of, of what's happening in, in the drug court. So the primary function of, of the executive committee is to ensure long sustain, sustainability, as we mentioned, and that is to identify not only funding, but ways in which the family drug court and the, the practices of the family drug court can be institutionalized. How is it that both the practices of the family drug court can be continued, and that may require additional funding, but then also how is it that they can make sure that they're having an impact on the entire systems in which they work, how are they making sure um, the executive committee really can help the, the rest of the team 
uh, the rest of the operational team uh, be successful by making sure that the supports and services that families need can be sustained uh, for the long term. A key part of the executive committee also is to be data driven, if you will, to make decisions based on information and data that's provided to them on a regular basis. This is another reason why annually just really isn't frequently enough for this committee to meet. We know that the executive committee is going to give final approval on practice and policy changes. Now, the steering committee absolutely should be charged with and able to make decisions for their, for their agency. Each member should be able to make decisions for their agency. But the executive committee is going to be making, giving final approval and making final decisions about some of, typically about some of the more major changes. So changes to eligibility criteria, for instance, um, changes in the population of focus. These kinds of things would be an executive committee approval process, typically. So for oversight committees, for executive committees to be effective, uh, we know that the members, um, direct senior managers, uh, have to give the initiative priority. That is, is family drug court a priority in the participating agencies? Members should be willing to change their own agency's policies to improve staff ability to achieve better outcomes for children and families. Again, this ties into making family drug courts a priority. And the, the way in which family drug court can be identified as a priority is if shared outcomes uh, are the goal of all team member agencies. And what I mean by that is that the only way really to convince each of the partnering agencies that family drug court should be a priority, and frankly, the only reason family drug court should be a, prior, be a priority for each of the agencies, is if we have data and information and outcomes that can really support that. So we want to demonstrate, we want to be able to collect, identify, analyze, and, and demonstrate that family drug courts are an effective practice, are making a difference for children and families in the community, and that those differences and, and those successes can be identified in an objective way with, with data and, and outcomes. And so, so we want to be able to make sure that that information is communicated to, to the oversight committee, to, to the executive committee, so that they can make those kinds of decisions uh, and that they're using data really to, to inform their decision making. So the advisory committee. Now, I mentioned that technically an advisory committee isn't part of the governance structure. Why do I say that? Well, an advisory committee is exactly that. It advises the steering committee, it advises the executive committee, it really is, is in place to, to support certainly and, and to advise uh, the, uh, the, the family drug court and, and its entire governance structure. We include it though because we, we think that it's important, uh, not just important, it's really a critical piece to making sure that the family drug court is part of the fabric of the community. So the advisory committee would be separate from the steering committee and separate from the executive committee and would be made up, its membership would be made up of community leaders and other interested stakeholders, uh, including um, uh, parent representatives and uh, community-based organizations and service providers. Uh, and in some cases, uh, some of the family drug courts I've worked with have advisory committees that are made up of of uh, 30 or 40 or even up to 50 people. That's a pretty large committee, isn't it? So the, the primary function, though, of the committee is to develop community support and to work to, uh, uh, to, to be aware of, of the participant and the family needs and also to identify ways of, of uh, uh, meeting those needs. So uh, a good example of this might be if the advisory committee is made aware that uh, there is a, uh, an increase or there's a greater prevalence of, uh, of illiteracy or functional literacy among some of the parents in, in the family drug court, then the advisory committee, certainly the, the issue is going to be addressed at all of the levels of the governance structure, but the advisory committee might be the, the body that's able to say, oh, we have a representative from the local library, from the public library on the advisory committee, and um, they're willing to add another uh, literacy tutoring course 
on, on uh, Wednesday nights, or they're willing to move their existing uh, uh, literacy, uh, literacy support um, session or, or education session, they're willing to move it to a different location uh, that's, uh, that, that's, that's more accessible to families uh, in family drug court, parents in family drug court. So there are a number of ways in which the advisory committee can support and help to meet the needs of, of families in the FDC. So uh, it's the the family the advisory committee rather um, at least meets annually. Um, many there are many drug courts out there uh, where the advisory committee meets um, as as often as as quarterly, and uh, and so uh, that's really um, that's really up to the individual drug court to decide uh, what frequency uh, is uh, will work. Um, the, the important piece is that it's given priority, that it's an important meeting, that when the advisory committee meetings are held, that the, that the attendance is robust, that there are a lot of, of community members um, attending, uh, attending and, uh, and participating in the discussion. And so uh, we, know that, uh, we know that in order to do so, sometimes less frequent meetings can, uh, can actually be more effective. But that, again, is for the family drug court to, to decide. So in that way, when we see the family drug court governance structure and all of the various committees uh, uh, together, <clears throat> we know that the family drug court, again, is, is the operational team and then information flows to the steering committee that information being the strengths and typically the challenges or barriers um, any obstacles that exist so that the steering committee can help to resolve those those obstacles the steering committee then provides information also um, to the oversight or executive committee um, uh, asking for assistance um, asking for assistance uh, in in overcoming those barriers or resolving those issues. The executive committee then, as you'll see by the, the double-headed arrow there with the advisory committee, the oversight or executive committee sharing information with the advisory committee about what's needed um, by parents and families, and then the advisory committee is, is sharing information about how the committee can hopefully resolve those issues and meet those needs of families. So lastly, let's talk about the warning signs of weak governance. We've worked with a lot of family drug courts ac across the country that have frankly been challenged by their governance structure. Once an operational team begins, begins serving families, once a family drug court is in place and they start seeing families and working with families on an ongoing basis, it can be difficult to, to make sure that the governance structure is in place and that the various levels of committees are in place and, and the membership is, is in place. So, so we know that that can, that can be a, a challenge for many. We know, though, that without governance and without governance structure, there really is a lack and, and actually a missed opportunity for many family drug courts. So one of the ways that family drug courts can assure that their governance structure is as strong as it can be is to periodically, during strategic planning or other kinds of processes, making sure that they identify any missing partners, um, <clears throat> taking a look at the membership of the various committees and making sure that there is the right, uh, the right individuals at the table. We want to make sure that the steering committee, that the individuals attending steering committees are, are, have the authority um, to make decisions for their agencies. We also, know, <clears throat> we also know that many family drug courts have a challenge with the various committees not fully understanding what their function or primary purpose is. So it's helpful if a family drug court has one or two or three or in some cases more um, existing committees to step back for a moment and clarify what the purpose is and what the function is and making sure that each of the team members on the committees um, understand this. And so revisiting this issue can be an important first step in making sure that your, your governance structure is as strong as it can be. So BOGSAT, what the heck is that? B-O-G-S-A-T. It means bunch of guys or gals, bunch of guys sitting around a table. <clears throat> and, and, and the purpose of this uh, acronym really is to remind folks that just because you have the right people around a table isn't all that's necessary for team 
uh, for, for teams to be as, as functional as they can be or to be as successful as they can be. If all we have is individuals coming to meetings, we've missed an opportunity to really enhance the work that the teams and these committees, uh, the work of these committees. So moving from having a bunch of people around a table to true teamwork is, is one of the goals, certainly, for governance structure. There are a number of different ways through technical assistance um, and, and other ways for, uh, for trust to be developed and for roles and responsibilities to be clarified. These are all important ways to move from people attending a meeting to really becoming a team and working together. We know that one of the reasons and one of the barriers to true teamwork can be ineffective or inadequate information flow. So examining not only roles and responsibilities, but also how information is moving from one committee to another, how that process can be formalized, uh, making sure that there's someone who's responsible for that process can be part, can be, be part of the answer. And then loss of momentum uh, or commitment by members over time. We've probably all experienced that if we're working in a drug court that's, that's been in operation for really any, any amount of time. Lots of enthusiasm, lots, lots of enthusiasm in the beginning of a program, and then as time goes on, sometimes commitment by members or by, by team member agencies uh, uh, falls away. And so finding ways to revitalize, sometimes that's retreats or strategic planning sessions, it's bringing all the committees together and discussing how, um, uh, how the, the governance structure can be strengthened. Um, perhaps it's having a facilitated discussion with each committee about their purpose and to revitalize really the work that they're doing. So now we've talking now we've spoken about governance structure in your family drug court. We're now going to switch gears a little bit and talk about leadership and how that ties into governance. This is Sid Gardner. I'm president of Children and Family Futures and looking forward to doing my segment of this presentation on governance and leadership. We make a distinction between governance and leadership, trying to clarify that governance is how a leadership body is structured, a leadership body that can make policy decisions about an initiative and a collaborative. Leadership, in contrast, is about providing the vision and the drive to use resources to get results and to use results, the achievement of a collaborative, to claim new resources while building trusted relationships within staff and among partners. This diagram attempts to show how information flow between resources and results and relationships is the lifeblood of an effective family drug court. Leadership makes sure that that information continues to flow. It's needed to encourage the flow, to analyze what the information and data means, and to frame decisions that the team needs to make together. Information flows about the results that the team is achieving. Information flows about the resources needed to achieve those results and to expand the program if it's working. And information is needed to build relationships among members of a team, both at the frontline level and at the policy level that we've been talking about under the heading of governance. Leadership is manifested and necessary at all levels and across multiple systems. We'll look at different ways in which that manifesting and the need for leadership is seen across multiple systems. There are different kinds of leadership that we talk about and work with family drug courts. One critical dimension is client-centered leadership. There's a very important difference between reporting at a monthly meeting, for example, on what agencies did last month and reporting on whether children and families are doing better. If there's a focus on clients, we're asking how do services affect children and parents, not just what services did we provide. The drop-off analysis tool, a walk through the system, and other tools exist that can help us focus on that kind of client-centered leadership. Results-based accountability means that a collaborative has a data dashboard, uh, a, a set of measures that may, in effect, be on the wall where the group meets so that they can use those indicators to determine their effectiveness. What we're basically talking about in client-centered leadership is a movement from operating in the best interests of the system to much more emphasis on the best interests of the child 
and of course the family. A second kind of leadership is barrier busting leadership. Barriers sometimes in a collaborative are accepted as givens. Frontline staff say, we keep running into this problem of eligibility or of resources or of training. And that's sometimes accepted as unchangeable. Leadership that has a barrier busting mindset, however, does not accept barriers as given, but rather sees barriers as goals and targets for change. Effective leaders see barrier busting as a normal way of doing business, and they know the difference between barriers and excuses. Some of those excuses are confidentiality won't let us share information, or other agencies don't understand our clients, or our funders won't let us do it, or sometimes we don't have the funding to take our efforts to scale. It's a test of leadership to ask whether these barriers these reasons given for not being able to serve clients effectively are what leaders are focused on or whether they take those barriers as given. Barrier busting leadership takes barriers as a challenge and tries to ask where that barrier came from and how it can be changed. Another way to frame leadership is talking about how it has to be adaptive. Ron Heifetz at the Kennedy School at Harvard has defined adaptive leadership in his work as the practice of mobilizing people to tackle tough challenges and to thrive. There's a focus on organizational and personal change by looking at the values and processes for achieving change. It's critical to handle resistance to change, including understanding the process of empathy. You can tell staff you need to change the way you do this. You need to record information about substance abuse. You need to record information about your clients. You need to record child welfare outcomes. But if staff haven't been doing that, you're asking them to change. There's naturally a resistance to change. I've got a routine. I want to do it that way. I'm used to doing it that way. And adaptive leadership recognizes that people won't change just because you tell them to. They will sometimes need you to understand why they think they can't and why in fact they may not be able to, which goes back to the issue of barrier busting. Leadership understands boundaries. It understands that you may not have vertical command over another agency. They may not report to you, but a horizontal relationship enables you to have an adaptive relationship. We are going to solve this problem together, not because I control your agency, you're not in my vertical chain of command, but because we need to work together, we can get more resources if we work together, and we can, and back now to client-centered leadership, we can serve clients better if we work together. That's what we mean by adaptive leadership. Leadership doesn't just happen. You don't just appoint somebody and say, you are the coordinator of the family drug court, or you are the judge in charge, or you are the child welfare or substance abuse treatment or early childhood or home visiting coordinator. Formal leaders can be sometimes the critical players, but so can informal leaders who may be closer to the clients. So there's a need for leadership development as a part of the work program of the agency. Just assuming that leadership will automatically occur when you appoint somebody or when somebody convenes a meeting may miss all the barriers to that leadership coming into being. So a good collaborative asks itself, what training, and, what training and staff development programs do we need to develop leadership capacity? We talk about stages of collaboration, and leadership is in part recognizing which of those four stages you're at. We originally developed this concept in working in the early childhood field, where as you observe children, they crawl and they get up and walk around and toddle and fall down and get up and walk and then they start running and sometimes they run right out of the door and go off to their adult life. But at first, in a collaborative, we have a level called information exchange, getting to know you, using your acronyms 4E and SACWIS and understanding somebody else's, uh, somebody knowing about the SAPT block grant or uh, what different terms mean in the treatment world or in the judicial context. So that first level of information exchange is getting to know you. Then after a while, 
a group that's been meeting together, sharing what they do, decides, let's get somebody's money and do a sh- joint project, a shared grant. Let's get outside funding, not using the funding we've got today, and run a joint project. And we draw the move to the third stage as a jagged line because it can sometimes be very steep and very difficult. Some collaboratives never get past the second level. They do a project, they define success as keeping that project funded for those 50 or so families, and that's it. But changing the rules and redirecting funds and eventually changing the system to where we're focused not just on getting a grant, but changing the system by using existing funding. There's always in any given community or state more funding already there than you can get from external grants. External grants can start things, but they can't sustain them. And so changing the rules and changing the system, dealing again with the barriers that block the process of changing the rules, and eventually making the institutional changes, learning enough about those barriers to change the rules permanently is a way of focusing on existing funding and redirecting existing funding toward innovative projects that have proven that they're successful. Those are the four stages of collaboration. And again, leaders know what stage we're at, when it's the right time to move to the next stage, and when it's important to stay where you are to make sure that we've got the relationships among the partners that enable us to go up the ladder to the next stage. Each stage demands leadership. And that's what we're looking at when we look at these stages of collaboration. You can also see leadership emerging from the history of family drug courts, the leadership of the initial judges all the way back in 1994 as the first family drug courts emerged, the ingredients identified by work outside consultants and those that operated family drug courts did together, grant funding from three different federal agencies coming online in 2004, improvements in practice adding the dimension of children's services, not just services for parents, looking at trauma as a critical element of the services that are needed, and focusing on evidence-based programs, not just well-intentioned programs that hadn't proven their effectiveness. Systems change initiatives have come online more recently, where we've said if these projects work well, aren't we ready to move toward changing the system so that we can have more than another project? And finally, we institutionalize and infuse and learn how to sustain. Again, at each stage, we've got to have leadership to move toward, from, from grant funding toward practice improvement toward changing the system and then infusing and sustaining those changes throughout family drug courts. The challenges to leadership are recognizing that moving up that ladder also brings challenges to leadership in many ways. It's said that management is doing things right and leadership is doing the right things. The first of those is about efficiency. The second of those is about goals. The vision and the drive, again, as we said earlier, toward moving toward making sure we have a common purpose, not just a shared project. Doing things right is important. Making sure we're doing the right things is more important and is a fundamental task of leadership. Thank you for listening to our webinar presentation. To further your learning, please download the webinar discussion guide, which provides questions for your team to explore and next steps and resources to move your team forward. Again, for more information about Children and Family Futures, the Learning Academy, and the FDC TTA program, please visit our website, our Family Drug Court blog, or email us. Thank you, and we hope to see you again here at the Family Drug Court Learning Academy.